Yes, so Chris Deacon has come to speak to us about the magic of six metres. So a warm welcome, Chris. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I'm not quite sure where I can stand. I can actually see everybody and not get in the way of the skies at the same time. So we'll, we'll, we'll sort of do our best to tell you what. Great. Thank you. And we'll stand, we'll stand here. Maybe I can sit on you. We can move that. It's fine. All right. So. Well, when I said I would do this uh, talk, I didn't know that the bloke who wrote the RSGB book would be sitting <laughs> So that's sorry, definitely sorry. ambush. <laughs> but I would like... Sorry, I should introduce myself. Okay, so I'm G4 FX. I've been licensed uh, since I was 16, which was in... Um, about the same time as a lot of you, I imagine. Um, I've been on six metres for 35 years since the initial permits were issued. Um, I used to edit Six Metre Group magazine, I then was the secretary and I'm now the chairman of the UK um, Six Metre Group. Okay, so just so I know what I'm dealing with here, apart from him, um, <laughs> how many of you are active on Six Metres? Well, well, well. Oh, there's a few wells going on there. Sort of, <laughs> sort of down here. How many of you I've never been anywhere near six metres in your life. Well, that's interesting. So the difference between the two are the ones who tried it for five minutes and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> or they're dyed in the wool HFers who wouldn't touch you with a barge pot. Oh, oh sorry, CDFC. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's called, my talk is called The Magic of Six Metres because they talk, they call Six Metres the magic band. And they call it the magic band because a lot of the time there's nothing there and then all of a sudden there is. Like magic. Like magic, exactly. So it's, um, and, and some of the experiences that, that people have are things like, like that. Um, and obviously... Friends, if you want to work Italians every day, go on to 20 or maybe 40 now. Um, it's not true that there's no DX except at Sunspot Maximum. That's what people used to think, actually. When we were first on the band in the 80s, I was, we were astonished, actually, that we could work across the pond at Sunspot Minimum uh, by Sporadic E. Uh, whenever you check the band, there's nothing there. Well, that's probably going to be the truth because um, you have to actually work at it to find it. Oh, there's no activity. Well, if you go on the monthly um, UCAC uh, RSGB contest, it, it's full from sort of 50.13 to 50.29 sort of thing. There's people all over it. So there's plenty of activity. It, it's, the challenge is to find the path. I've never worked ZL. I would love to on six metres, though. And to do that, you have to understand a bit about how it works. Because, I mean, when I started, I suppose six metres was still new. You couldn't buy a radio with six metres in it. Uh, not in this country, anyway. Um, so it was still sort of, it was sort of technically new. That's not really the case anymore because virtually every HF rig has got, so it's got six metres on it. But... The magic of it is, it is about how the signal gets from here to here, from A to B. And if you don't know anything about that, or if you take no interest in that, shall we say, you ain't going to work much. So, just to give you a few examples. So, sporadic E, um, ranging from, well, you can be quite short, under 500 kilometres to 2,500. It's a single, single hop. Yes, oh, Patrick. Very... And it sort of sounds like that. Right. And of course, probably ten minutes earlier there was nothing there. That's the way sporadic key works. You do also get multi-hop sporadic key. Of course, all you CW experts will have this one. So that's two hops, Cypress, mm. Cypress Beacon. And it's quite common in the summer to work, um, work the Caribbean. Um, 
Um, you also get sporadic key associated with auroras. Test your CW again, chaps. So, Svalbard, um, one guaranteed to captivate a room full of radio amateurs and play them something. Particularly CW. What's the antenna on that? On the beacon. On the, on the beacon end of it? Or uh, no, is that a beacon? How big an antenna is Oh, five elements. Five elements. Yeah. But I'll go into yeah. you know what you need yeah. a bit uh, a bit later. I mean, again, that that was probably too hot. But so that was a relatively short skip. Um, and again, this summer there will be short skip propagation like that from the south of England. I used to be in Darlington, IO94, and I regularly, well, regularly, most years, would work down to the south coast on sporadic E at very strong um, signal strength. So there's, there's things to work all the time, you know. It's, it's frustrating when you look at DX maps and you see oh, all God. the people working. Tell me about it. Yeah. Just another no one more hop and I'll, I'll be. Yes, there. if you don't want frustration, don't do six metres. <laughs> definitely, definitely part of it. Um, you won't be hearing this this year. Very nice when it happens. Um, it won't be happening for another five years. It probably won't happen at all. But there's plenty of other stuff. As I said, that backscatter is interesting. So he was pointing west. I was pointing west. Not audible on the direct path. I mean, obviously, all these things do happen at HF, but it's such a muddle of. A different modes at HF that you can't usually pick out exactly what's going on. But uh, backscatter, whether it's off, we're not, and I couldn't tell you whether it was off uh, an uneven ionosphere or from the sea, the rough, a rough sea, sort of bouncing back. But either way, it's going to be very strong backscatter. And you get backscatter F, F2 or, um, or sporadic E. And obviously, there's Aurora. Who's, oh, you've all, several of you worked Aurora stations, I'm quite sure. Did he, did, did he know that his mistake on CW is going to be listened to yeah. every time <laughs> I do this talk? Somebody's going to, going to hear that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's started off as a pure CW tone. It's not a defective signal. It's bouncing off the aurora which is a load of electrons spinning around the Earth's magnetic field, going in various different directions, and so you get a spread of Doppler shift, and it turns a pure signal into um, a hissing sound. Um, and six meters is actually quite an easy place to work here. The, 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 the spread gets bigger and bigger the higher the frequency, as you'd expect. <laughs> to reading SSB on Aurora. Um, personally, I, I don't usually bother, I don't want to see them. Um, and meteor scatter, now this is, this is interesting, because, uh, well, well, you probably know, most meteor scatter operating is actually digital these days, but I thought I'd dig out uh, an actual audio recording. And this is a beacon again, and this is cheating, it's four meters. Well, not six, but we sort of cover both in, in our thinking these days. So the interesting thing about it is that right at the beginning of that, you heard that thing go woo like that. And I think from listening to it, there might have been two meteors there. It was one woo, and then another one woo, and then that produced a long, a long echo. It would be a bit boring if it was a short one, so I thought I'd pick one. 
that was fairly long. So, so there's a whole range of different propagation modes and at different times of year, different times of the solar cycle, you're looking for different types of, of propagation. Sorry, what, what were you listening to there? That sounded like a, just a carrier. It was a GB3 golf mic, which was a 4 meter beacon, okay. not on the air anymore. But it was mostly carried. There was a call sign in there oh, somewhere. Okay. Right. I probably talked over it, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just in, in, in summary, sporadic E, I mean, the reason when we were originally talking about doing this talk, and, and I think John said, give me a whole list of dates. And I thought, well, what's the right time to do a six meter talk when it's just before the, start of the, season. the sporadic E season? Yeah, yeah. Um, which has started already. Um, I worked on SM. Today, well, I mean, sometimes it's a bit difficult to tell whether it's a very long MS meteor scatter burst or whether it's a sporadic key, but it was there for quite a long time, so um, so it has started, and it's, it'll be spotty in April, picking up towards the end of May, probably something somewhere every day, June, July, um, fading away again, probably after the Perseids in in the middle of August, and um, um, well, it's usually a bit on into September. And that happens every year. And if anything, um, it's better at solar minimum. If there's any correlation at all, there is some research done by the BBC uh, 40 years ago, which did show a, a slight anti-correlation to um, the solar cycle. And that's because, I think, probably, because of there's more magnetic disturbances, basically, at solar maximum. Um, F2, when it happens, then, Although the first time I worked F2 on, it was like Christmas, I think, um, on six meters, but um, October, November, so around the equinoxes, but near, near at sunspot maximum, I usually say that um, you get east-west um, F2 on a reasonably predictable basis if the smooth sunspot number, i.e. the average, not the peaky thing, is over 100. It won't be that for quite a while. TEP we talked about um, over a couple of um, more highly ionised regions north and south of the magnetic um, um, equator and that does allow propagation somewhat further away from solar minimum, solar maximum rather. Uh, back to we talked about aurora we talked about, that happens to be more common during the equinoxes too but it can be happen at any time. Actually that also tends to peak on the downward side of the solar cycle. Hmm. Meteor scatter, could be other meteor showers or randoms, and obviously then you've got your tropo and your tropo scatter. And there's quite a lot of people doing moon bounce these days, uh, particularly uh, uh, digitally. It's probably he is also around Christmas uh, period. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a, the big peak is in the summer, and then there's a minor peak uh, around Christmas. But like, you know, I've worked it every month, and every, every month, actually. Oh, wow. um, Mid-December to mid-January, so we, we, the six meter group, we have uh, two um, marathons, sort of con pseudo contests, if you like, to work as many grid squares as we can. We have one in the summer, but we started one in the winter as well, which is December and January. And people work hundreds of squares. Um. So a little bit of, um, little bit of your science, right? Um, I'm sure you've seen diagrams before, and, and apologies if this is in any way teaching grandmothers. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to reach for. I think it's going to. It's got a little. It's got a little whatnot. Yeah. So, so this is the daytime, and this is the nighttime. So that um, most, uh, sorry, the, the, the altitude you can see hundreds of kilometres up the side here, and th this is actually this this line is the electron density, so it's the, the number of free electrons um, in the ionosphere. Interesting, just to sort of put a reference point on it, the troposphere where we live is down here, the stratosphere where aircraft fly is sort of here. Uh, interestingly, you know, you think it gets colder as you go higher. Um, in the stratosphere, it actually starts getting warmer again where warmer means the molecules, the atoms, the molecules, whatever it is, are moving faster. And then in the mesosphere, it starts getting colder again. <laughs> um, and then it starts getting warmer again. But up here, if you were out in there, well, you'd suffocate, obviously, you'd die. <laughs> um, but actually, you, would, it, you wouldn't feel either heat or cold, because there's actually not enough molecules there to conduct heat. It's that thin. But 
there is enough there to reflect uh, radio waves. So most um, shortwave radio, even down to 80 uh, envis uh, on 80 meters or on 60 meters or whatever, uh, is actually from this layer here, the F2 layer. That's the one that only works on six meters um, in near solar maximum. Uh, in, a, a, in the daytime it's split between F1 and F2, at the night time it sort of coalesces into one layer. Sporadic E happens at about the same height as the E layer of the ionosphere. So what's going on here is you've got X-rays and ultraviolet rays coming in and ionizing the mo molecules and atoms uh, to create ion an ion a plasma, an ionized gas which reflects things. So it conducts electricity so it reflects. Uh, there's something different happening in the sporadic E region because normally at 50 megahertz it would go straight through straight through the lot. The D region there disappears at night and that really just absorbs. But sporadic E happens day or night and uh, this, is, this is roughly where the meteors and actually the aurora is also <coughs> happening around that, that sort of um, height. So I, d I don't know whether anybody's how knowledgeable people are about sunspot cycles and stuff like that, but let's have a quick look at where we are in the solar cycle, just so you know that there's no chance of F2. So that's the previous cycle, this is the most recent cycle, and the total sunspot number is the, is the green line, and you can see we're well, well down, but that means there are good prospects for single and multi-hot sporadic E. So just to prove that point, that's uh, the map captured from the own for KST chat page of one day last summer. Yeah. So there were contacts between, but it tends to be north of the equator as you can see, because it's a sort of a temperate zone uh, phenomenon. But, except for a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, there were contacts all the way around the world. There's plenty, um, plenty to work. And obviously, if you've got a bigger area and lots of power and all that stuff, you're going to work and here and work more. But you can still work it if you're in the right place at the right time with something, um, something much, much smaller. What so, is the... Uh Thing that, um, on the west coast of Africa, there's a, there seems to be a very strong. Yeah, that's um. Now, it's isn't it? Then? It might be. It's either T R or T A, T T J. Because T R H C A is right. T R H C A, yeah, uh, but I'm not sure that's the right place. Maybe it was T R H C A, something like that. So there's a, and I think that is sporadic, e, um, and a couple of hops down from. Uh, from Europe, but last year, no, sorry, year before, we actually worked down to um, South America as well, uh, and I think that was a, a combination. This come back to the combination of TEP and uh, um, and ES. The other interesting thing. Oh no, I'll talk, actually, there's a slide about it. Other side about it. So, are we seeing from that that it really, it really is just a northern hemisphere phenomenon? Um, it's a temperate zone phenomenon. In other words, it happens in the southern hemisphere as well, uh, and they've had their sporadic E season over the our winter. Um, that's not to say it's. The, I, I have heard reports of sort of VK four to Eastern Europe, sort of the Mediterranean. Am I wandering around too much? No, all right. Sorry. <laughs> I, I tend to wander around. Apologies, Chris. I've noticed that. Um, you tend to get better openings to South America sort of later in the season rather than, than earlier. Mm. I don't know if that, if that coincides with your observations. I think you get... I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to pronounce on that, I don't yeah. think, because I think I've worked South America in June and July just as much as mm. later. i tell you what, though, that I find that the, the longest hops happen early and late in the right, season. Right. In other words, the ionization sort of builds up and it gets more intense and you get more and more shorter stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I sort of had this idea in my head that you've got a certain amount of ionization. It's either clumped up very dense and you probably work it on two meters <laughs> or it's 
more, more broadly spread and you, you, get, you can uh, work um, longer, longer hops. And what's happening with the sporadic key, um, you never know how to pitch these talks, so you, you guys probably will be asking that question, how, how is it actually formed? Whereas, um, this is the current theory, um, whereas the ionisation for normal F2, actually normal E layer propagation is caused uh, from things like oxygen, nitrogen being ionised uh, by solar radiation. Um, at that level, at that 100 kilometre level, you, you get a build up of um, metallic ions, and that, that iron particularly, and the associated electrons that, 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 that go with it. And there's a phenomenon called wind shear, which is believed to cause a concentration in the vertical direction of that ionised area. Because if you, um, in the presence of the magnetic field of the Earth, if you've got one wind going that way, and one wind going that way, the Lorentz sort of force it actually will push. I mean, obviously, if they were the other way around, it would make it go that way. But it actually pushes it together and, and produces a very thin but very dense reflecting reflecting layer, and that's that's that how it works. And the Jim Bacon's. Um, there are many causes of sporadic E. There are many things that, that very good talk. Causes, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the 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 fact that it's wind shear is fairly well established. What causes the wind shear is the question. So we know pretty much where the ions come from, meteors. Hmm. We know pretty much. Um, that it's some kind of wind, or at least it's a very good theory and it does seem to work. Um, but what causes the wind shear? And obviously there's, um, we've all had the experience of hearing thunderstorms at the same time as uh, sporadic heat, those of us who are active on, on six metres. Um, so there are a lot of people who say, oh yeah, it's all due to thunderstorms. And maybe it is. But Jim's preference, and I, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot, certainly of, um, of, of circumstantial evidence towards it. It's just to do with the jet stream. The jet stream is a, is a Temperate zone. That's how I got into that long ramble. Into mm -hmm. it's a temperate zone. When the jet stream is doing this, um, then you get uh, more intense compression and more ionisation. If that makes sense. So somebody, no, it's not working. Is it? So it seems to be very good going east, east to west. The other bit is. Why? Yeah. I think go west to west. Probably my copy out. Sorry, was, was the monitoring station in that one in the Northern Hemisphere? What, in, in well, this previous thing? Yes. Oh, sorry, now this is from the, um, this Where is from the DX cluster. So this is... That's worldwide, is it? Worldwide, yeah. spots recorded, um, it's fed by um, this one, I think it's just fed by the DX cluster, but obviously on digital there's also a PSK. Just Google for DX Sherlock, <laughs> you'll find it, if you like. I just yeah. wondered if there was a similar thing for the Southern Hemisphere, but it doesn't show because there's no communication north Good and south. Good point. It's just that that was in the summer here. Right. Um, so you pick the different one in December, it's showing see. in the south, would it? Yeah. You do, yeah. Most, yeah. Well, except for what we were saying before, that there is actually a bit of a peak but in the winter yeah. in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere as well. If you look at the front cover of the current Six News, um, you'll see a, a similar picture, but from over the winter, our, our winter, um, and it's in the Southern country. Hemisphere. But of course, there's not so much land down there, so they're, they're a bit a long way from anywhere. Um, but they, many, uh, not very many there. operators. No, well, and, and the Australians were working South America, which is a path that goes very near the pole. It's a sort of very uh, northerly sort of path from where they where they are. But not that kind of density, they just don't, there isn't the activity. Yeah. Is it all making sense so far? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy with questions by the way, so do carry on. Just a question. Yeah. What do they use, mostly upper side band or lower side band? Um, upper, upper side band, CW, it's much more common, of course digital is sort of changing everything, We're not, nobody really knows how that's going to work out. Um, but um, on, on six metres, it's very normal to switch between the two, CW and SSB. It's all upper side band. Well, I mean, people work FM as well, obviously, but... Yeah. Upper side band. Upper side band, yeah. And you'll find that's what you're really what voice. defaults to, yeah. Uh, CW, and now, obviously, uh, FTA, JT65, etc. FM? Yes. 
and it is possible to work sporadic ease. The X on I've done it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But it, it just requires somebody to be in the right place and a reasonably strong opening. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, if you go on 10 meters, you get loads of sporadic key, FM, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm afraid you're probably right. Um, yeah, so... Okay, I'll keep pressing this thing. Um, so, this is um, some of the BBC research from about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and, but basically what it's, it's showing you is uh, the, the peak in the, the diurnal variation of sporadic key in the summer and in the winter. So the top is the summer, the bottom is the winter. And um, you can, the, the, the scales are different. You know, you've got 10 and 20 there, and you've got 100, yeah. two or yes. 300 there. But, but they exist. They definitely exist. So it's ideal for retired people because it peaks late in the morning, so you don't have to get up early. Uh, it's also ideal for working people because it peaks around tea time when you go home. Yeah. And that is, that is real, <laughs> just because that's where the people get up. And you can see that the, it looks as though that it's um, evening based in, in the winter. I can't really um, vouch for that, but that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So, the, and the, but to stress, the whisper of key particularly, it can happen at any time of the day or night. A lot less likely at 3 o'clock in the morning than it is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But it is possible at, at, at any time, and you have to uh, be appropriately um, vigilant. And of course, these days, because we have the various tools that we have, the cluster and the, and the chat pages and the PSK reporter and so on, it's actually much easier to find openings than it was before. And I think we catch a lot more openings that were there before, but nobody found, nobody knew back uh, 20, 30 years ago. So we were talking about TEP. Um, as I say, it's, it's, it's not terribly likely that we're going to have much of that this year. But just to um, just to show, this is a, a, a sort of a slice through the Earth with the, uh, with the magnetic equator here, and there are denser patches. And I think they're about 15 degrees of latitude north and south of the uh, geomagnetic equator. And so, you, again, if you're in the right place at the right time and there's enough ionisation there, this is not sporadic key, this is F layer, um, then it will bounce around without touching the ground. Um, it's not TEP if it doesn't go across the equator, for matter of interest, because the whole trans-equatorial bit is fairly sort of fundamental to it. Um, so that if we're working here down into LUPY, um, it's probably sporadic key for the first part, TEP, and then possibly sporadic key at the other end. Years, year, years and years ago, I worked from Darlington when I, I lived up there um, in um, I-94, um, Charlie Echo 8, down, right down there. And I'm pretty sure that was TEP in the middle and sporadic key at both ends. <coughs> that was the first. It's one of the good things about six meters, you can work the odd first. And another thing which is, I think, very likely to happen this year, which is another very interesting bit of propagation, is, I mean, back in the F2 days, if we wanted to work Japan, <coughs> you had to beam to the Indian Ocean. And it was some kind of scatter, some sort of side scatter, either from the sea or from the ionosphere over the Indian Ocean. So the signals were always very weak and difficult to resolve. But back in 2006, which was the previous solar minimum, we were all rather surprised to discover direct path. So again, here's a Google Earth thing, So, and that's a particular plot. It's, it's, it's one of the things, situations where six meters is really, really fun, because you, I was sitting there one day, this isn't my uh, chart, so I don't know which day this was, but, um, and you could see stations work in Japan and it was just slowly working its way across Europe and eventually it arrived, arrived here. So this is a you know, direct path and significantly stronger sporadic key. And, and there are various ideas as to how this might be, um, that there may be some kind of different sorts of propagation in the, uh, the mesosphere 
um, across the pole because it's not supposed to be spread a key up there. Uh, but actually, Jim, did you see Jim talk? Oh, I, saw, I saw his talk um, a couple of years back. There was yeah. a suggestion about the theory about non delucent clouds that occur. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm not sure they've got any, any charge in them. That's the only thing about yeah. a non delucent cloud. But well, last year, we, did, we sort of did a drawing one, and he uh, actually looked at when there was an opening here between Japan, and he looked at where the jet stream was, and it was sort of doing this, looping up and down. And he managed to plausibly indicate that there are half, three or four patches. Mm. There could have been sporadic ionization, which actually created those those paths. So um, there will be contacts. Well, uh -huh, touch wood. Probably be contacts because these days we've got digital, so it's easier anyway. See, 2006 we didn't. Um, to Japan, China, um, Korea, um, and who knows that elusive Hong Kong maybe as well. Uh, but the, 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 the North Americans have also been working JAs in a very similar way, and this winter the VKs have been working South America. Uh, both ends in daylight, as it says, as it says there. Um, very interesting. First written about by Han in 2006. I don't think we still know, really know what's happening, but it's, it exists, and it's well worth um, looking for. It always seems to be sort of the week either side of the um, summer solstice. So <coughs> the peak. That's why he called it that. Yeah. Although the first one I heard last <coughs> year was quite early in June, and the last one was oh. the July the 31st. Oh, that's quite so, late, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that?